Yeah, we're in Ephesians. We will look at 3, 1, 3, 4, and 5 a little bit. Uh, but we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 2. So, you know, I figure we've been out of it for a while, and I've got some stuff rolling around in my head, so I'm just going to do what I feel like doing. Take this journey. Sometimes I feel like scribbling outside the line, so I'm going to do it. <clears throat> So, do me a favor, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I don't even know if we'll get through everything tonight, but we'll... This is just to get our feet wet. So, thoughts rolling around in my head. Go back to Ephesians, the union that we have with Christ. I've had several people over the last weeks asking for my notes and stuff on that, and then at the same time people responding. Um, which is good, thinking through this stuff. and It's good because I think some people are being introduced to thoughts that they've never contemplated before, and then others like, how do, how do we make this look, <laughs> look in our life, right? And uh, that's always the tricky one. And sometimes we, we kind of go, well, it's too, it's too beyond me, so why even bother going there? Because it's like, how do we even make it work? But if we're not thinking about it, then we're not really ever going to get to where we're living it out either, right? I mean, if, if we're not consciously putting it before our mind's eye and contemplating. So some of the things I was looking at, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, Paul gives this exhortation to the believers there. And he says this, he says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, and then he goes on, verse 27, but God has chosen. So he gives this exhortation. It's an imperative. So it, the word here, we have translated consider, which is good because in NASB it gives it that, that intellectual aspect, right? Use the mind, consider. So the word is blepite, is see. And there's a different word in Greek, harao, which refers to bodily sight. This is used metaphorically. It's talking about mental vision. Now, you won't know it in English, but in Greek, actually, the, the form here can either be a present active indicative or it can be a present imperative. The context tells you what it is. And in this context, this should be taken, blepite should be taken as an imperative. So he's telling him to do something, right? So he's telling him to, to bring this, I would say, before your mind's eye, to consider, to take to heart. The, the term expresses an earnest, heartfelt intent, a spiritual contemplation, right? I want you to think about your calling. It's something that I think that is missed oftentimes. We don't spend enough time praying, one, we don't spend enough time meditating. We don't spend enough time contemplating, like serious contemplation, like really working at it. C.S. Lewis talked about one time, and sometimes he says, you know, believers, we, we get this thought in our head, and it's a really great thought. And it's like, man, we, it sort of enters into our mind, and immediately we sort of dismiss it. We go, oh, it's lunchtime. I go get something to eat. And we put the thought aside, right? He says, no, when that comes, stop and give all of your intention on that. Why? Because likely it's God who's bringing it before your mind's eye. He wants you to think on this. But so oftentimes we have these moments where we can have this great, you know, enlightenment from God about a spiritual truth and we set it aside for something else, right? And if we're constantly doing that throughout our day and not giving time to these things, then, then it's no wonder our mindset isn't in the right place, and it's no wonder that our actions aren't in the right place, right? But you have to think it before you behave it, right? Because we behave what we believe, which is the fact. And especially 1 Corinthians was important because he wanted them thinking the same thing in the right way. Verse 10 of chapter 1, he says... Brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you agree with one another, speak the same thing. It's a political term. Just to tell you, the Democrats are way better at this than, than the Republicans. Speak the same thing. They all have the same idea. They'll even remove Bernie Sanders just so they can win. It's all about their thing. The problem is that, that the right tends to be so fragmented and we can't get on those core things and stick to them, divide ourselves. 
So he says, agree with them, one another, there will be no divisions among you, but that you be complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. And here the mindset, the way you think, and then the, the result or consequences of that way of thinking. His whole concern for his Corinthians is getting them to think the right way. And so therefore, he comes to chapter 1, verse 26, he says, I want you to consider this. I want you to give some intentional spiritual contemplation to these things. I might talk about this on Sunday. Bat around, but it's interesting. Like you look at how many times in the Old Testament the look backwards to Exodus, right? The deliverance, the redemption, right? And that constant look back, look back, remember, remember, remember. So Paul's going to say, I want you to, to, to bring these things before your mind's eye. But here's what's interesting. He calling here, and Paul's writings refers to God's work of drawing people to faith in Christ. It's always the effectual calling. And it's interesting because when you look at the context in which this comes in, when he refers to the calling here, he's not just talking about that moment of conversion. He's talking about the circumstances around it, even. So think about that. When he talks about this, he's using calling as a metonymy. He's talking about the circumstances and everything involved in that. So when he walks through this, notice what he says then. He says, see to your calling, brethren, not many were wise by human standards, not many powerful, not many were born of privileged position. In other words, I want you to look at the circumstances out of which you were called into salvation. Give thought to this, not just to that moment, but the surrounding circumstances of it, your life, your position in society, all of that. I want you to think about this. He goes on, verse 27, But God has chosen what the world thinks foolish to shame the wise. God chose what the world thinks weak to shame the strong. God chose what was low and despised in the world, what is regarded as nothing, to set aside what is regarded as something, so that no one can boast in his presence. This is true through this letter. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verses uh, 9 and following, 1 Corinthians 6. He says... Or do you not know, verse 9, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, idolaters, or adulterers, or effeminate, or homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor vilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But notice this is verse 11. But such were some of you. And then he talks about their present spiritual condition. But you were washed, you were sanctified, right? You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the same spirit of our God. So he wants him to see the whole thing, not just this, the, the, the significance of the spiritual thing, the whole thing. Look where you came from, look at where you are. Look at all the circumstances of your calling. Look at this whole situation. Take it in. It's interesting because he does the same thing in chapter 7 when he talks about the fact that you have two unbelievers, they marry, one comes, one is called unto salvation. He's going to exhort them, just as God has assigned you your place, just as you were called, I want you to stay in that place. Verse 17 of chapter 7, Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each, in this manner, let him walk. And so he talks about this relationship previously, about a believer and unbeliever and all that. Take into consideration the whole situation. right? Not just the elements of your salvation, but the whole thing. But contemplate. And going back to chapter 1, verse 26, this is present tense. He's talking about making it a habitual thing, continually bringing these things before your mind's eye. In other words, contemplate God's work of salvation in your life and all that that entails and the circumstances surrounding it. And don't forget this. Think about this. So with that in mind, I'm going to look at a few things, but... Going back to Ephesians, all these things are, are important for us to, to stop and just think through. And I know that we take these chunks, we're looking at this stuff, sometimes it seems awfully deep and it's, you know, I, I can't get my mind to this. Just the exhortation, give your mind to it. Think about it. All of it, right? I mean, and then you speak out of this. I mean, you're speaking out of the things that, that I mean, that's the beauty of our, our conversions. They are all different, right? They're not the same. We, we experience the same thing spiritually, washed, sanctified, justified, and all that, right? But at the same time, totally different, right? Your life setting is different. So I'm sitting with a brother the other day having coffee, and we're talking. And, and I grew up in the household. I grew up in godly parents, right? Christian home, missionary kid, pastor's kid, all that stuff. He didn't come from any of that. 
in, in a period of just a short period of his life as a child, 43 different homes he lived in. 43. Imagine that. I mean, he's like, there are places, my mom was recounting different places because I couldn't even remember. From age four to nine, he's like, this block of stuff. I, we moved so many times. If you think about it, 43 times you're moving around from place to place. Not only that, but the stuff that he went through in the home was just traumatic. Our lives were totally different, right? But the salvation aspect is exactly the same, right? What happens to us. But the, the caution is don't forget because realization, you know, for him, I said, isn't it just amazing, though, how God has taken that and the people that you minister to now, the lives you touch, right? You think about that, the lives that you are touching, God prepared you for that, even with the bad stuff, as horrible as it was, right? And it doesn't dismiss it, and it doesn't make it at times any easier, right? Still tough, but at the same time, it, just keeping all these things in, in your mind's eye and thinking on them, but especially when we look at what God has done for us. So go back to uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and look at a few things. I'm going to come back to 1 Corinthians again. Uh, so I'm going to put some things in order a little bit. We'll look... Eternity, then present, and then how God sort of enacted these things in our life. So I'm going to be a little systematic here. <laughs> Put some order. All right? Just some things to think about. The reason why I came here to the passage of 1 Corinthians 2 is not only just the challenge to, to contemplate, think through these things, give mental attention to it, earnestness to it, but it's interesting because the word that we have in verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 1 that he chose us is also used in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians 26 and following, right? God chose, God chose, God chose. So think about that, actually. Just the usage of that term in the two different contexts. I probably won't even answer that question tonight, but just think about that. What we have here and then what happens there, and are they referring to the exact same point in time? So, one, three, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. So, has blessed. This is awesome because here's the statement. And there's a series of these aorists that come. The first one is in verse 3. He blessed us. The next one is in verse 5, predestined. And then the other one is in verse 9, made known to us. And I'll just tell you that in verse 5 and verse 9, they, they, they explain. So, if we can do it this way, we'll look at verse 4 and 5 a little bit. Let me do it with verse 8 and 9. So, he says, which he lavished on us, looking back at the grace, verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 1. This grace he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. And literally, we say, having made known to us the mystery of his will. But this is describing how he did it. So in other words, we could put it this way, and this is interpretive, but just this is how it's going to go. So just so you understand. So he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He did this by making known to us the mystery of his will. So that explains the lavishing the grace on us and, and wisdom and insight. He did this by making known to us the mystery of his will. Okay? So think about that. I wrestled with those two verses for a long time. Like, what in the world is the connection? Trying to make sense of what's going on. So put it that way. So verse four explains, uh, verse five explains verse four, as we'll look at in a minute. But this sort of, it, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that time is not an issue in Greek and Hebrew. It's not. It is for us in our mindset. And I say that because we talk about the fact that he chose us in a sec, but we get so hung up on past, present, and future. That's not the concern in Greek and Hebrew. It's the kind of action that matters. So the heiress participle here does not draw specific attention to time, but simply expresses the fact of his blessing us. Okay? He just blessed us. It's just a statement. The other thing that's interesting is that when you look at verse 4, just as he chose us in him, some take this as causal, but it's not because he chose in him. Or some take it as it's explaining what he means more specifically about this blessing. No, he's saying just like he did this, he, he elected us and did all these things right, just like he did that, he also blessed us. In other words, the blessings that he makes reference to here aren't totally encapsulated in verses 4 and following. In other words, he doesn't touch on all the blessings. There's more blessings to be had. 
So keep that in mind when you read through the rest of Ephesians. There are other blessings he's going to talk about in, that, in, the, in the book. The spiritual gifts, right? All of those things, those are all a part of the blessing that comes. And it's a comprehensive thing. So some want to limit it and say, well, he hath blessed us or he has blessed us. Put it purely in past tense in the sense that they limit it to when Christ came. He blessed us when Christ came. They want to limit it to that one event. No, it's, it's a comprehensive statement about all of the things he's done for us. So I always say that all the things that you've blessed us with in Christ, right? I keep saying that in my prayers and in my thoughts and eventually I'll get it, right? Eventually I'll start thinking that where there's so much stuff that God has blessed us with and it's not just here. So this is a general statement overall, but then he's going to talk about some ways in which he has blessed us. He's going to talk about him choosing us and so on. But he moves from before the foundation of the world to the historical point in time to eternity future, all of that. So, this is cool. I did this with the high schoolers on, on Friday. We're looking at this. In chapter 1, verse 4, he talks about the fact that he chose us before the foundation of the world. He's going to touch a note that he's going to pick up later in chapter 3. But it's interesting because he talks about the fact of, of creation and God working before that. And he's going to pick up on this thought of this plan of God. In chapter 3, verse 11, notice with me. He says, this is in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and literally, I would translate this, which he created in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, he's going to talk about the fact that the, the world was created, right? The cosmos. And he's going to talk about what God did before that, that creation. But before he created the world, he created, essentially here, he created a plan. It's an eternal plan or purpose. And he created it in Christ Jesus. So that statement in 311 is looking back to eternity past. So before he created the world, the cosmos, he created a plan. This is cool because you think of two things combined. Cosmos. It's the word for world. So it can be used of like... The world system, the, the way of thinking, the, the spirit of the age, that kind of thing, right? But it can also be used in the sense of the universe, and that's what's being used here in, in 1 4. He's talking about the entirety of the universe. Cosmos is a great word because it means, at its heart, order. So for, for a believer, we immediately get a, a clear understanding. We're talking about creation, we're talking about the universe, we're talking about a created order. That's what it means, cosmos, right? So we get our English word cosmetics from, right? So that's essentially what women and young girls do with cosmetics. They're putting order to their face. They're arranging it, putting in order. It is an ordered universe, right? It's an ordered universe. What's amazing is behind this ordered universe, right, which implies in intelligence and design and all that stuff, an ordered universe, right, the implication that just from cosmos. But then he makes a statement that he created this plan, this eternal purpose, before he even created the universe. Prothesis. That purpose also indicates that there is intelligence, design in this plan, right? <clears throat> also that there is, in a sense, reason, right? When we talk about the word purpose, it's a great word. That's why, like when you study theological books, they'll talk about the decrees of God. I prefer to use the plan of God or the purpose of God. There's a lot of different reasons for it. One is because it simply is just biblical. You don't find the word decree anywhere, right? In Scripture, we find plan and purpose. But it's even, it, it's telling in what it communicates to us, the fact that Paul chooses this term. There's intelligence behind it. So you say, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, that tells me then that God doesn't function arbitrarily. In other words, God's plan wasn't by emotional impulse, Right? There was intent behind it. There was design behind it. There's reason behind it. In other words, there's a reason for everything that happens in this cosmos, this ordered universe, because there is an ordered plan behind it that drives all of it from beginning to end. So Paul's just laying groundwork here in chapter 1, verse 4, as he's talking about this issue. But again, he's not laying down all the blessings for us, just some of them. And highlighting them through the rest of the letter, he's going to touch on other blessings. But all of this is a part of this great grand design of God, this purpose of God. And chapter 3, verse 11, notice it's singular, not plural. Not purposes, but purpose. Now, there are 
purposes involved in that. There's different elements involved in it, but it's a singular whole. It's a unified thing. It's like when Paul talks about the fact that he's an apostle through the will of God. It's always telemata, singular, not plural. Why? Because he sees the will of God as a unified whole. All right? So this is beautiful whole system design plan of God that's being carried out through time. So as fragmented as things seem in the world around us, we have to remind ourselves that there is one singular purpose behind it, one singular will that's driving the whole thing, and all of our blessings are a part of that, are a part of that. And I think this is the, the thing that was so amazing for Paul is because here he's sitting in the, in, in, under arrest, unjustly so, all the things that were happening to him the wrestling he's having, you know, he records in the first part of Philippians, all this stuff's going on at the height of his ministry, right? Got to be thinking, I got to be out there and do this stuff, right? And all of a sudden he's realizing God has this purpose and all of this stuff is a part of that. And who would have thought sitting in a house arrest that the whole praetorian guard would have heard the gospel, Right? I mean, that's not how, in our plan of, of thinking, we wouldn't have said, okay, we want to get into, right, royalty. We want to get into this realm, we want a higher echelon of, of society. How do we do that, right? We wouldn't say become a prisoner. Say, so Joseph, how do you become second to Pharaoh, ruling all of the empire? How do you do that? Let's say, let's sell you into slavery, right? And that's how we're going to get you there, right? But that's how God works. So we have to remember this stuff. So Paul, then we talks about, I'm a prisoner of the Lord, right, in this letter, not of Rome, not of anyone else, but a, of, of God. But all this stuff lies behind that. And these blessings in we have are, are part of that. So let's look at this then. He chose us in 1-4. Just as He chose us, right, in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. And I take in love, I've wrestled with this for a long time, more I, I look at it in light of, its, uh, of the letter itself, and we'll come to this. I'll give you all the reasons why I think so, but I, I take it with the end of verse 4. For the longest time earlier, I just did like everyone else. You just take it apart of verse 5. In love he predestined us sounds so, it sounds fitting, right? He predestined us unto adoption of sons. He did this in love, right? And it sounds great. I mean, it's just the flow of thought you would think, right? But I'll give you some grammatical some tactical reasons why not. I don't take it that way anymore. So <clears throat> here's the statement. He chose us. Common Greek sense of the middle voice, and that's what we have here, is to pick out for oneself to choose. Now this is interesting. Give you some examples of the way this word is used. Go with me to, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Luke 6, 12. Same term is used here. It's used in verse 13. So Luke 6, 12, we have it at this time. He went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And then when day came, he called his disciples to him. And notice, and he chose 12 of them whom he also named as apostles. So, this is interesting because it helps us understand how this term is used. Okay? But Jesus goes off, prays, he comes, he calls all of his disciples. That means everyone has been following up to that point, right? So we're not just talking about them, but everyone is following up to that point. He calls them all together, and then he's going to select or choose 12 out from their midst. Right? Give you another example. So, give you contemplate how this term is used. Uh, Acts chapter 1. This is really cool. I love this. So, in Acts 1, we know what happens here. This is, you know, Judas, he goes off and out of remorse hangs himself. And therefore, he has to be replaced. And in chapter 1, verse 24 of Acts, the same term is going to be used here as in Luke and also there. But just to give you a sense of what's involved in it. 
So in Acts chapter 1, verse 24, it says, And then they prayed, and they said, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show which one of these you have chosen. Now, notice how you, these two, right? So they had positioned two possible candidates through which choice can come, right? So keep that in mind. So here you have the option out of some, you're going to have a selection, right? Out of all the disciples, choose 12. Out of the two, you're going to choose one. The thing that's really cool about this, look what, he's, look what they said in the, in the prayer to God. Of these two, you have chosen. It's already been done. They acknowledge that. Not who are you going to choose out of these, right? And then cast a lot. No. They knew God already chose according to His sovereign choice. It's already been done. Then they kind of cast the lots to find out which one it is, right? And then after that, we never see them casting lots to make decisions ever again. Why? Because the Holy Spirit comes and acts too. No need for it anymore. He becomes the guiding force. So that's just the use of the term. So we have that, that sense of that there is a group of and then there's a choosing out from. Right, so it's interesting because then when you look at the Old Testament Septuagint, Bahar, the term, this term is equivalent to that, and used in the, in the Septuagint to translate, expresses the idea of selecting for oneself out of a number. So it's used in regards to the nation of Israel, right? Of all the nations, as God reflects through Moses, right, as He speaks to them in Deuteronomy, out of all the nations, right. All the peoples I could have chosen, I chose you. And not because you're more powerful, more numerous. It's just because it's my sovereign choice to do so. Right? So that is the idea that lies behind this. There is that selection out of... So you think about that. So out of all of the people that exist and will exist for generations to come, out of everyone, God selected you and I. Right? Before the foundation of the world, He chose us out of them. We can at least say that much in regards to it, right? So I want to put more into it. Well, if, if, if God has chosen us, right, to be His people, then obviously He chose some to go to hell. doesn't say that, not in the context nor in the Word itself, right? That's a logical assumption, but that's the key word there. It's assumption, <laughs> right? So just say what it says. So what is that simple fact that God has chosen out from a number for himself, and in this case, we know he's chosen out of all of, all of humanity for all of time. And middle voice in, he chose us, and knows he hasn't, it's not hath chosen us, chose us. You say, well, what's the big deal? Well, notice the statement, the timeline, when he did this. He chose us in him before what? Before the foundation of the world. In other words, it's an eternal choice. Not merely hath for eternity past, and that's it. No, He chose us, period, for all of eternity, past, present, future, and embraces all of that. Now, I'll let you sit and think out all the implications of that, right? But it isn't hath chosen, again, because that's putting time element into it. Time is not a key issue. Hath, has, chosen would have just put it in that, like that definitive singular act in the past only. No has chosen or he chose is better how we do it he chose us in him before the foundation of the world and not the time issue because again there was no time when he did this correct right so i'm not imposing anything on it right just see that there was no time when he did this so he chose us <clears throat> and again like i say then that carry out the implications of that it's an eternal choice it's an eternal choice So I'll give you a thought then. If you look at 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and following, right? Pay heed to your calling. So it's talking about conversion when you were called, right? He says, Be heed, pay heed to your calling. Give attention to that. And then he goes on to talk about that God hath chosen, God hath chosen, God hath chosen. Is he talking about that eternal choice? Or is he talking about choice in time and space? 
In other words, when, when I was seven years old, in Sunday school and my teacher shares the gospel, right? Easter Sunday. This will be my spiritual birthday, come Easter again. But on Easter Sunday, the teacher shares the gospel, right? God effectually calls me unto salvation through that proclamation, right? At that moment in time, out of those kids in that classroom, He chose me out from them. Right? So He chose me in eternity past, and then it became a subjective reality when He chose me out from their midst that morning when the gospel was given. Right? So just to put some pieces together for you, right? Contemplate that. So take this thought a little bit further then. A middle voice that God chose us for Himself to be His own special people. This then leads into verse 5. So 4 and 5 go together. We start to see that there's a connection there. He chose us for Himself to be His own special people. And that's the thing about the middle voice. The focus is more on the subject doing the action. Right? And therefore there's this involvement in the process of it. So we use the, the simple example. Active voice, he loosed, right? Passive voice, he was loosed, right? It happened to him from someone else. Middle voice, he loosed himself. He did this and he had, right, a share in the consequences of that action. That's the point that's being drawn out here. So we can say this then in regards to this, and I, I do selection because of the word, but we're talking about the doctrine of election, right? The selection is in Christ. The selection was pre-temporal choice before the foundation of the world. And it's an eternal thing, so we, we don't have that time element attached to it. We translate it. He chose us, not hath or has chosen. If we're going to be committed to the text. Selection is unmerited. God chose us for himself. There's no reference to us in the, in, the, in the process at all. And then this selection is aimed at holiness, that we should be holy and blameless. Right? So we realize that between the, the verse 4, we have the choosing eternity past, and then we might be holy and blameless for Him. Right? This is looking into the future, and everything in between, that's all of human history. Right? And our history. <clears throat> and then selection is by, all means, is by the means of predestination. So here's how we look at 4 and 5 then. So translate verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons. Or we can translate it this way, but it's interpretation more than translation. He did this by predestining us unto, unto adoption, right? So in other words, he's explaining how he chose us or how he selected us in eternity past. He did this by predestining us. And the term that's used here means to mark out the boundaries beforehand. And the English word horizon comes from this. Praharizo. So by God, His sovereign choice marked believers off in eternity past. Right? So in the mind of God, in the counsels of the triune Godhead in eternity past, looking at all in existence will be, He selected us, He marked us out. These are mine. Right. Therefore, then, predestination is not to be thought of, then, as an activity taking place prior to election or choosing. In other words, we're not talking about a sequential thing. This happened, then this happened. They're exactly at the same time. The one is explaining how the other took place. So basically, then, the Father chose us or selected us for Himself by having pre-horizoned or pre-encircled us in eternity past. And it says nothing to those who were not. It just says everything to those who were. Right? And I'm always reminding folks, we look at passages like this, the tendency is to ask, why not? Right? But that's the wrong question to ask. Like, why not so-and-so? No, why anybody? That's the true question. And then 
selection then, our election should usher in then adoration. Because he started off in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And that is what all of this is, 3 through 14, is just this long doxology, this, this declaration of praise. And that's really what it should ultimately lead us to, is just to praise God. Right? So it, it, it is to do nothing. It brings assurance to us as believers. It brings comfort. Right? It brings a realization of how much God has set His love upon us, unmerited so. Right? It, it reminds us of His mercy and His grace, but it is in no way supposed to be something that makes us look at ourselves in a prideful way. Right? To where we start looking down at others and so on. It's always to issue forth in the glorification of God, not ourselves. <clears throat> So, I'm going to take you back to 1 Corinthians. We're going to end with this, this last thought. You're going to talk about the communion of Christ. You put the pieces together. So we looked at, select us in eternity past. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and following, right? He chose us, time and space, by that calling of us, right? So he enacted that eternal plan in our life. That objective reality became a subjective reality, right? So this is just looking at that that moment of calling, but I, I was just reflecting on this because I did this whole idea of like fellowship and communion and stuff. I it just drives me nuts sometimes the thoughts that we get. So I want to look at this, and, and this again is going back to that understanding of uh, that the union with Christ. It's not sort of this sentimental thing because. So I've been wrestling, and you haven't been here on Sundays, Dan, so I've wrestled with using the word community. And we can use it, but man, let's, let's make sure we put a whole bunch of other stuff around if we're going to use it. My problem with that is because the world uses the term community, especially now. We have co-ops and all these other things, right? These communities, right? And so there's this sort of this carrying over, like, well, we're not any different than they are. See, they try to have community. Like, we have community. There's just something missing. You just got to put God in the equation, right? It's like you sort of like this last little meant addition, right? And then it makes it all whatever. But essentially we're the same. But it's not the same. The idea of community and, and all that is just totally different when it comes to the church. The same thing we talk about, fellowship and all that. So we look at community in the world, it's centered around things that, that, that have nothing to do with God, and we know this, right? I mean, we look at people who like, they, they have the similar mentality of this is the kind of life I want to live. Dietary, right? We're everything organic, you know, farm to table kind of stuff. So you have people organizing around these ideas, these sentiments, right? Even moral ideas, right? They join themselves together around these things and we say that's similar to us, right? The only thing is you just got to bring God into it. No, it's totally different. It's totally different. Because this community life, this fellowship, it, it's a communion in something or someone. In this case, it's a communion in Christ. It's a sharing in Christ. It's a partaking in Christ. And it's more than just like when we think about fellowship hall or fellowship over food, which is really good, and I think it's good and healthy for the body. We should do more of that. But it's more than that. And it's so much deeper than that. But we sort of get the idea of like, it's just merely a social idea, right? We, we, we have fellowship around coffee and donuts, and we call that good. We call that fellowship time and fellowship hour. And we feel like, wow, we really did something by connecting in that, right? But no, it's something way more radical than that. So this union with Christ, that God put us in this union in eternity past, it's being fleshed out in our life here and now. It's something far different than us just merely getting together, right? Something way different. So I want to unpack this for you a little bit. So for 1 Corinthians 1, I'm just, just some thoughts. So in 1, 9, he says this, God is faithful, and he starts off with this, and that explains verses 4 through 8, and especially it, it affirms verse 8, who will confirm you, right, to the end. Why? Because God's faithful. So he starts off verse 9 that way. God is faithful. Through whom you were called into fellowship of the Son of Him, Jesus Christ, the Lord of us. Right? So, just some things about this. Through whom we were called. 
So this is the problem sometimes we get so like organized in our theology, everything well packaged and whatever. It's nice to sort of have a sense of how things fit, but don't be get so regimented with it. Because here's the thing, we usually think of God as being the one who is the ultimate cause, like the principal mover behind everything, right? But then the Son is sort of the mediation, right? The mediating agent through which the Father works, okay? So let me break this down for you. So here's the word. And the term by, we translate it by, but it's something I think can be a little bit misleading because we can also see this sort of like the principal cause, not the one through whom it happened. So a little bit of a breakdown of the term. So through, dia in Greek is from dua, meaning to. So if I put it in English, we have the word to or twice, where we get the word between, by twos. Okay? So that's what dia is. So you have one here, one here, you have two, right? And you go between the two, right? So it has the idea of mediating agent and so on. That's what Paul is saying here. The Father isn't the principal cause, He's the mediating one. Now, I know I don't expect you to get it all right now and understand. Just go back to 126. Consider your calling, brethren. Just do me a favor and give some, some mental attention to this, right? Some spiritual contemplation. He's not talking about the Father as the primary cause here. He is talking about Him as being the agent through which the call comes. So Paul can, in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, he can refer to God as the one from whom, through whom, and unto whom are all things. Okay? So Colossians, we understand this. So Colossians, we, we looked at 1.16, talking about all things were created in Him, through Him, and for Him, right? But think about those thoughts. In Him, right? Conditioning cause. Through Him, mediating cause. For Him, final cause or ultimate cause, right? But it's always understanding, with even those prepositions, the Father is the main primary agent behind that, right? We look at Genesis 1. God said, and it was so, but all this took place in the Son, through the Son, and for the Son. But each one of those prepositions indicates His involvement, but the primary mover was God working in the background, the Father. Okay. So here then, the reason for God Himself serving as the agent is because He's talking about the fact that we were called into the communion with the Son, the fellowship of the Son. So therefore, the Father is the agent. And he's calling us into this relationship with his, with his son. This term for called then is referring to, in verse 9, is the time that when the Corinthians, you and I, were incorporated into the body of Christ by God's effectual call into our life. And Paul always uses this term, kaleo. Kaleitete here, built off kaleo. It's always used in reference to the effectual call of God. The only time we have it is in Matthew where it says, right, many were called but few were. Right? It's the only time we have this, anyone other than believers being called. Usually we find in Paul's writings it's believers who are called and it's always efficacious. In other words, there was a response. Right? It took effect. So God the Father interposed to bring us into the communion of Christ. So the call of God is never merely just an external invitation. It's an internal effectual call. That's why I refer to my salvation when I was seven. God effectually called me unto salvation, right? So through that proclamation of the gospel message, He called me unto Himself and He called me into this communion with His Son. Now here's the thing. This is the communion. He called us into this. We get so individualistic with our salvation. This keeps us from doing that, right? Sometimes we get so focused on the individual, we lose sight of the community. But sometimes we get so focused on the community, we lose sight of the individual. There's a balance to be kept. But notice what he says. He called us into this fellowship of the Son. So this term fellowship refers to a close mutual relationship, but it's more than that. It's not only a personal association. It suggests a sharing in or a sharing with. So when Paul exhorts the church in Romans chapter 12, when he talks about the sufferings of believers and, and hard times, we are supposed to share in koinonia. We are supposed to share in them. In other words, we take on their sufferings, right? And we become sharers in that. We partake in that. 
some have taken this to, to think of, like we talk about fellowship, right? We talk about the church. Sometimes they're equated, the church and fellowship. Well, fellowship, right? Bible church. Sometimes people take fellowship and they equate it and make church in that synonymous. Paul's not doing that here. They're not synonymous. The one, one breeds the other, but that's not what he's doing here. So here's, here's if I can lay it out for you. The sun is the center and the sum of this, right? This the, the, the koinonia of the sun. He is the sum and cent, center of it. It is the fellowship that we partake in. All those who call the name of the Lord partake in this, right? In other words, we're talking about this collective participation in the communion of the Son. We share in Him. We partake in Him. A share in His sonship to God as a consequence of heirship to God. When he had that statement in Romans 8, 29, he says, We're firstborn among all the brethren or many brethren, right? In that passage, he's talking about the fact that we have this heirship, right? We have this inheritance that we received. We partake in the sonship of Christ. We participate in Him. We partake in Him. Now, I, again, I don't think that you're going to grasp all this right away, but just to think on this, when we talk about the issue of God saving us and calling us into an existence, we talk about the union of Christ and what happened in eternity past and even now and all of that, and the bearing that it has on our existence is far deeper than what we usually think or even talk like. So much so that he can make this statement here and he adds on the fact that it is our Lord. We not only partake in and share in his sonship, right? We become fellow heirs with Christ. We share in him. We partake in him. We also partake in the fact that he is our Lord, his lordship, his glorification. And the fullest manifestation of his lordship is going to be when he is glorified in the end. We all become sharers in that. We become a part of that, right? Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 3. Christ who is our life, right? When he is manifested in glory, we will be manifested with him. We partake in that. We share in that. We have a part in that. So as you think about this union with Christ, we come back to Ephesians and we'll, we'll continue looking at that. But just think about this relationship that we have with him. It's far deeper than what we usually say and think, Right? The dimensions are far greater. It's more than just a social thing. There's something that has happened to us in regards to our soul. When we were regenerated, we were united with Christ in a vital and intimate way. We became partakers with Him. We share with Him. We share in everything that He is. When He talks about communion, He talks about that. Do we not share in the body and in the blood in a very real and dynamic way? And the answer is yes. Yes. But the problem is that so many of these terms that we use in the church, they're cheapened. They're so shallow. Community, fellowship, right? It's partly because I think we take on the definitions from the world. Church. We think of church as a building. That's how the world sees it. The church is that structure on the corner of wherever and, and whatever. And that's how they see the church. Scripture never talks about the church as a building, ever. It's always the people. So we say, well, I'm going to church. How do you go to something that you are? It's not possible. And you say, well, then how does that make any difference in my life? It makes every difference. In, because then when you walk away from church and I go home, I'm the church. So when I go home, there's the church. And in my neighborhood, there's the church. Wherever I am, the church is. Right? I'm just an extension of that. So my hope is that we contemplate these things, we think about these things, start putting some of these pieces together, connect some dots, but we'll just start claiming some of these terms back from the world. Right? Using them as they're meant to be used. Speak of them as they ought to be spoken of. If we need to, in conversation, sit down and give the definition to them, let's give the definition to them, right? So people understand what we're saying. Because our existence as believers should be so much more radically different than it is. Right? Table fellowship is great. Food fellowship is great. But there's something far deeper 
that exists there, right? And it's more than just sharing a common idea or ideal or a dietary habits or where we like to live or any of that. It's something far deeper. It has to do with the condition of the soul bound together with Christ. And if it's an eternal binding together, it's inseparable. And therefore, that means that, that what has happened then looks forward to then and everything that happens in time and space in our life and the course of our life is looking forward to the final eternal resting condition. Right? It's like I always say, living for the kingdom doesn't start when the kingdom comes. <laughs> it starts now. Right? It starts now. So next time we'll come back and we'll, we'll continue looking at chapter 1 and following. But just give some thought to that union with Christ. Right? It's a lot more than just a sentimental thing. It's a lot more than just merely shared ethics. Nor is it merely just we give mental assent to a decree. There's something that's radical happened to our being that we are partakers of Christ. We share of Him. Right? That's why I think when Paul says, he says, I'm absent from you in body, but I'm present with you in spirit, it's more than just a sentimental staying of that my heart's with you while you do this. No. If Christ indwells us, as he says in, in 1 Corinthians, right, 6, that we have been joined to him, we are one spirit with the Lord, that when they gather together and the Lord is in them and they're bound together by him, then Paul is present in a very real way, right? I'm not going to ask if there's any questions because I don't know.